Welcome to Dirt Man Token. Tonight's story, we welcome back the incredible mind of Rico once again with the second sequel in the Bloodlands storyline. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And title. The Devil's Daughter. Let's get straight into that. Prologue. The serpent was the most cunning of all the creatures in the garden. Part 1. The serpent rears its head. Three years had passed since the battle against the Mountain King and the Trolls. Eric was approaching his 18th birthday and had started having more frequent and unusual dreams. Bjorn was also having dreams, dreams of a large serpent speaking to him from within an old temple of some sort. And oddly, it seems as if the serpent had female features. Eric had been allowed to begin training with the King's Guard after his 17th birthday because of how valiantly he'd fought to ring the church bell in the battle to defeat the Dover Gruben. Much of that seemed like a distant memory compared to this season's poor harvest due to the drought, and many were troubled, saying that there were omens of bad times to come. Bears and wolves were attacking sheep and even a few people. And there were also sightings of the black ear, Gibcat, or panther, which is definitely believed to be an evil omen by the Norse people. Many streams and water sources were significantly decreased, and some of Bjorn's farmhands were no longer needed due to the lack of work, and other farmers suffered similarly also. At the week's end, Eric headed home after his duties with the King's Guard was done, and as he rode homeward for his big birthday celebration, his mind drifted with thoughts of a young beautiful girl named Ingrid who lived in the village. He noticed his horse becoming a little spooked and began to hear the faint sound of something shadowing him on a thickly forested ridge above and to his left. He would slow and he would slow. He would stop and he would stop. And after doing this for about five minutes or so, Eric slowly dismounted his horse and drew his sword, using his horse for cover. The horse was now obviously agitated, beginning to snort and paw at the ground. And suddenly, a shadow as black as night flew over his head and landed behind him as he whirled about with a shield and sword at a ready. It was a black panther, a creature of mostly myth and legend, but there it stood, crouched, with his head down and tail up. It began to growl and hiss as if it was taunting him. Eric stood motionless as his horse behind him became frantic and then ran off. And as the two stared each other down, the cat continued to snarl and hiss, almost as if it was trying to communicate something. And after what seemed like minutes but was only a few seconds, the cat abruptly veered away and ran off so fast the night just seemed to absorb it. Eric began wearily walking towards home. Upon arrival, Eric found Bjorn and Lizzie getting ready to search for him. His horse had run there, causing them to fear the worst. And as he relayed the story about the cat, they told him about the other things going on. They entered the house for dinner and discussed their dreams and decided to go visit Father David in the morning. When as Eric slept restlessly, he began to relive his experience with the big cat. But now it was as if the cat was speaking, and he could understand it. He began to dream of a beautiful dark-skinned woman with huge dark eyes and large red lips. She turned her head, causing her long jet black hair to sway from side to side. She, or well, she was beautiful, and he was captivated with her. He could even smell the sweet aroma of her skin as he awoke sweating and breathing deeply, his heart pounding in his face. He lay back down and couldn't get back to sleep. At the breakfast table, Eric shared his dream. Well, there was a silence for a moment, and finally Bjorn told him of his dream and about a large serpent speaking to him. Lizzie put her arms around both Eric and Bjorn, with noticeable concern. Go now, she said. See the father, while Gretchen and I go to the village to see Harold and Astrid, and invite people to Bjorn's party, and especially Ingrid, as she looked at Eric and winked, causing him to blush. Part 2. Dark Omens. As Bjorn and Eric arrived at the chapel, a crowd of people were gathered there. 
A farmer to the south said a swarm of locusts had destroyed a third of his crops. Another farmer with an apple orchard had found worms in fully half of his harvest. As the discussion went on, riders from King Philip to the north galloped towards the palace, with one breaking off to see Father David. He said, Father, my name is Alcott, and I bring news from the church of fathers. He handed him a letter, and with Father Cuthbert's seal. Father David said, Ah, thank you, my son. Now go in to eat and rest before your journey back. He bowed slightly and left as Father David looked up Bjorn and Eric with a frown and said, Come, please follow me. And the three sat as the father opened the letter and read silently. He put the letter down and then looked up at Bjorn and Eric, saying, The day that many feared, it is at hand. Fear should dine. Birds are falling from the sky. Random animal attacks on people and floods in some areas and drought in others. And then he paused and said, Earthquakes to the east with reports of night creatures roaming and slaughtering entire villages and settlements. What does this all mean? said Eric. And Father David rubbed his brow for a moment and replied, It is possible that the Dragon Queen of Prophecy has emerged. When you and the Grigori captured the Son of Perdition, that was not the only offspring of the serpent prophesied in her secret texts. There was to be two, one male and one female. In Rome just over forty years ago, a nun began having dreams or hallucinations that Lucifer was visiting her in her chambers at night. And nobody believed her at first except for a handful of us. Months later, it was discovered that she was with child. Why, it was a big scandal and a young priest was scapegoated. And the Monsignor sent him away for merely believing her and showing compassion for her suffering. She had the child and it was deformed with scaly features and yellow snake-like eyes. The church fathers paid gypsies to take the child for their travel and show. No one ever knew what became of the little girl. What happened to the young priest? said Eric. Father David paused and sighed, looking up at both Bjorn and Eric. Ah, that young priest was me and this is why they sent me here, so far away. It seems that I have a gift for spiritual discernment and understanding prophecy that was not appreciated by the church in Rome. At the Norman village, Lizzie and Gretchen stopped at the gates while on their way to see Harold and Astrid. A small crowd was gathered around an old woman dressed in tattered clothes as she babbled cryptically. From the south they will come crawling by night as the wind one casts a shadow upon their appetite. Lars was standing there as Lizzie inquired. What is she talking about? Ah, this old gypsy was as crazy as the Volva was. She sits out here begging and claiming she can tell the future. Lizzie bent down and said, What is your name? Runa, she replied. And in you, Missy, I see two auras, one lesser and dark, one greater and light. You are not as you seem. What else can you tell me about these times we are in? An evil comes, one you have faced before in a fatal hour, but with you was one of great power. Lars leaned over and said, uh, How about you? Stop talking in rhymes and tell us what is going on, if you know so much. And she replied, All I know is that which I see in my dreams. She who rides Nidhogger, the great dragon, with her many followers. Lizzie handed her some money and wished her well. She turned to see Harold and Astrid standing behind her. Harold said with a dour look, My dear Lizzie, I fear dark times are once again upon us. Part 3. A Call to Arms Let's get straight into that. That evening, as Bjorn and her family sat at home discussing plans for Eric's birthday celebration tomorrow, they spoke of what Father David said and the cryptic rhymes of the old gypsy lady. They decided to go to bed early and rise in time to prepare for the next day's big celebration. Not Bjorn slept restlessly, dreaming about a fireball with wings ridden by a dark figure. Eric again dreamed of the seductive woman with long black hair and cherry lips, but this time her eyes were black and her tongue seemed to be forked. They awoke to breakfast, and their chores as Bjorn and Eric chose not to mention their dreams. 
As guest arrived for Eric's party, he talked with old friends with whom he had grown up. And then a wagon arrived with Ingrid and her parents. As she stepped off the wagon, Eric was frozen in place. She had wavy blonde hair halfway down her back and with eyes as blue as the autumn sky. He couldn't speak until she walked up to him and said, oh, Happy birthday, Eric. And he stammered to talk as his friends behind him snickered quietly. He finally managed to get out the words. Huh. Oh, hello, Ingrid. Uh, thank you for coming to my party. Bjorn turned to Lizzie and said, My darling, was I that awkward? And they had a good laugh. And as the day turned to evening, Eric and Ingrid had not left each other for even a moment. Suddenly, the sound of riders approaching was heard as three men on horseback drew near. It was the young priest, Jonathan, and two members of the king's guard. They dismounted quickly, and the young priest handed a letter to Bjorn. It was a letter from the king of Francia, requesting military support on behalf of the Church of Fathers in Rome. He requested Bjorn personally, and as many volunteers of the king's guard as could be brought to arms, and transportation by ship or other means would be provided. Captain Svensson was putting Bjorn in charge of 40 guards here, and he was to pick up 40 more from King Philip and depart as soon as possible. And as the party was prematurely breaking up, Ingrid put her arms around Eric and kissed his cheek, saying, Eric, and then tears came to her eyes. You must come back to me. He spoke to Ingrid's parents with a boyish shyness, not expected from such a large lad, and he said, When I return, may I court your daughter properly? And they smiled and said yes, and then she gave him another hug and kiss on the cheek and departed. And Lars and Arnie returned to the village to get their weapons and equipment for the journey. When they returned, they brought five more volunteers with them. And as Bjorn retrieved his things, Lizzie embraced him and said, The moment is at hand for our son. Take care of him and come home to me, my husband. And they kissed and hugged Gretchen. And then Lizzie hugged Eric and they rode away. At the palace, Father David told Bjorn of a vision he had had. From the east up through Africa and across the Mediterranean, a dark force is making its way to Rome. Then Frank here and northward. Here is the bundle for Eric that you gave me, for safekeeping. I had hoped we would have an appropriate time for his discovery, but these dire circumstances will no doubt be his test of fire. And the father said a prayer of protection for the troops and bid them farewell. Late into the following night, they arrived at the palace grounds of King Philip, and Bjorn's old friend, Father Thomas, greeted them. Forty more of the finest troops stood ready to leave at first light, travelling mostly by river, and before the sun topped the trees, they rode south, ninety-nine in number. Arriving in Italia, there was much fear and commotion, with people fleeing north to the Alps to hide from the rumoured terror. The ninety-nine rode out with Bjorn ahead, and with Eric behind him, and Commander Latreau to his side. And as they rode further south, a blind man sat in ragged clothes along the side of the road, preaching of the apocalypse. Bjorn stopped to ask him what he knew. They come by night, devouring our people and then retreat underground by day. It is the end of times. The devil's daughter sits atop a great dragon who brings fire and death. And as they grew closer to Rome, the carts, wagons and people on foot fleeing to the north were more numerous. Part 4 the final stand. A wagon of wounded soldiers approached them. Bjorn offered a halt. Centurion, what can you tell us? The centurion's head and face were bandaged, and he was missing part of his right arm. Over half of my men are dead or wounded. Our battle lines are along the north side of the Tiber River, near Rome. Tonight, our troops will make a final stand, but we anticipate the collapse of our battle lines without mass reinforcement. And Bjorn asked, What or who is attacking? A dark woman sits atop a dragon, directing an army of serpents, who seem to obey her very thoughts. These lizard-like creatures come by the dozens. For every one we kill, they kill ten of us, and then the other four-legged creatures, larger and lesser in number, and with a head like a cobra, and sharp talons on their webbed feet and teeth 
like razors, but upon their backs they carry a tail like a scorpion, with large barb for a stinger that can impale or decapitate with a single swipe. Their only vulnerability is their softer underbelly, if you can survive to get that close. And the men behind Bjorn began to chatter nervously, and he turned to face them and spoke. Man of honourable God, I say to you, you are the best trained fighters in the lands. Your fear will overcome you before the ferocity of any beast. He raised his sword high and said, We ride south like the Valkry to fight with heart and steel. And away they galloped at full speed. Arriving as the sun was still above the trees, General Tannerus met Bjorn and his troops in the staging area to the north of the town, on a hill overlooking the river. Now the general had been awaiting the arrival of a renowned King's Guard troops. What are your plans? said Bjorn. And the general replied, We are fortifying with troops and volunteers from all over our lands, but I fear it is not enough. We build barricades along the river banks with spikes and catapults for rocks, flaming pitch or whatever we can throw at them. But the time of their attack nears, for when the last light of day disappears over the horizon, we anticipate the beasts will ford the river in mass, where we will open fire as they cross. Well, should the lines collapse, then we will fall back here to make our final stand. And beyond and his men proceeded to the river, where they dismounted and took positions along the river bank, in gaps between the other troops. Attention, men. We have about two hours to eat and rest. I suggest you do so now. He turned to see Eric, looking exhausted, and said, My son, go rest yourself, but take this bundle with you. Find a place of solitude. You will know what to do. I had hoped to be there with you, but fate I will not allow. Eric walked wearily into the trees, finding a comfortable place to lie down. But before he could open the bundle, he was asleep. This seductress was inside Eric's head, beguiling and beckoning him. She caused his young libido to run wild, and he broke out in a sweat with a face flush. She seductively said, Hello, Eric. I am Serafina, and I hunger to press my lips against yours and feel your arms around me. Then gave a devilish smile, when she leaned forward with her long black hair fallen across her shoulders. She then licked her lips and pushed her arms together to amplify her cleavage. Eric sat straight up in a lather of sweat, breathing heavily, and began to rub his eyes. The sun was now behind the trees, and he realized the bundle sat upon his lap. It was almost dark as some soldiers caught out movement on the other side of the river. Shapes of different sizes were slowly moving about among the trees. Bjorn could now see dozens, if not hundreds, of glowing yellow eyes. The reptilians were as tall or taller than him. The four-legged creatures were about the size of a cow, and their skills, indeed, looked formidable. But the massive tail with a ball and spike at the end. He passed the word down the lines. Archers, fire first at their faces to blind them. Follow up with shots to kill. When they breach the barriers, light the pitch at your spear's end. Thrust at their face while your partner inflicts a mortal wound. And the creaking sound of catapults could now be heard as the timbers were cranked back. Bjorn paused for a moment to ponder where was Eric, but knew he could only hope for a transformation of his very own soon. But then a screeching sound was heard in a distance as Bjorn could hear the faint whooshing sound of large wings. In the darkening sky, he saw it. A dragon with fire snorting from its nostrils. And sitting upon it was the serpent woman in his dreams. Then a bellowing high-pitched cry rang from the sky. Kill them all! Part 5. Wings of Fire A multitude of figures broke from the trees on the south side of the river and the water began to splash and churn. And just as Bjorn had ordered, his men fired arrows striking many creatures in the face, and some narrowly missing. Some who stood up to screech in pain were met by more arrows to their throat and chest, but yet another wave hit the water, 
The catapults were unleashing fiery hell upon the creatures both in the water and on the other side as arrows from other troops rained down. Bjorn fired his own arrows, scoring many hits, but then the unthinkable happened. A roar was heard just above as he looked up to see the dragon bearing down parallel to the river. He fired two arrows directly at the woman riding the beast, but she dodged them. The dragon opened its mouth wide and roared, unleashing a huge flame directly where Bjorn stood. He barely had time to cover with his shield as a ball of flame erupted all around him and the sounds of men screaming in agony followed. Uh, Eric nervously opened the bundle to discover the cloak, sword, shield and helmet along with a breastplate. He awkwardly put them on as quickly as he could as he heard the battle cries not far behind him. Finally, he unsheathed the sword with a childlike curiosity, holding it in front of him as if he were a great knight of old. Suddenly, he bent double and dropped the sword with its point sticking into the dirt before him. He reached forward to grab the hilt and a blue light started to emanate around him. He no longer felt like he was in his own body. Now, Bjorn rolled onto his knees, coughing as smoke and fire was all around him. He saw Commander Latrell and others trying to quench the flames of men on fire. He joined in, dousing a bucket of water on one man. Take charge, Commander Latrell. I'm going to look for a vantage point to attack that woman on the dragon. He ran into the trees and up a small hill and fell upon his knees with the sword out before him in both hands. He cried out to the throne of the Almighty Father. I ask for this power just one more time. The thunder rumbled above him and a bolt of blue lightning struck him. When it thus settled, he stood over seven feet tall and with a set of white wings unfurled as an almost translucent light emanated from his eyes. He heard the horrific screams of his comrades and shot up into the air. Eric now stood almost seven feet tall and with a blue glow in his eyes. He felt as though he had just had a long dream, but it was only seconds. He turned to see in the distance a large four-legged scorpion beast disembowing one of his comrades and then leapt into the air with a loud whoosh of his wings. Bjorn rose above the smoke and haze to see that the dragon was roaming around for another pass in the battle lines. He flew directly into its path, giving off a glow that caused the dragon and its rider to stop in place, hovering as the huge wings whooshed. At a distance of no more than a hundred yards, he can now see this woman who rode the beast. Now, Eric swept down through the clouds of smoke and cleaved two of the four-legged scorpion beasts until one stuck him, broadside causing him to tumble into the trees. Two reptilians and a scorpion beast advanced on him at great speed. He instinctively leapt forward, tumbling over their backs, severing the scorpion's tail and causing it to shriek loudly. The two reptiles rushed him, and he nimbly sidestepped and severed the head of one that was closest. He grabbed the other by the back of its neck and impaled it with his sword, and it flew at a line of advancing creatures, slinging it at them. Bjorn now hovered looking at this woman with beautiful female features but snake-like yellow eyes and a line of scaly spikes protruding up through her long black hair. Scales began at her neck and covered her voluptuous body. She bore sharp teeth and long black fingernails with claws for toes. She was tall, lean and muscular and with a look of a seductress. She spoke. Who is this lone Grigori which dares to interfere with a Seraphina? the daughter of the true king. Soon I will call forth the ancient beast Tiamat and sit astride the great dragon where I shall rain fire upon the entire earth, the she-devil continued. From the long line of Lilith I come. My father seduced a young nun just to enrage the throne. I am the Nephilim offspring, and I am more powerful than my weak, pathetic brother, whom you put in chains. And as Eric darted about slashing more creatures, he realized they were not just some sort of human reptile hybrid. These were killing machines out of a nightmare. The troops were about to be overrun, and he had a decision to make. Reveal himself over the river to more easily kill these creatures while they swam and be seen or continue his hit and run tactics using the smoke and haze for cover. Part 6 The 99 Let's 
get straight into that. Commander Latrell saw that the battle lines were about to collapse as reptilians and scorpion creatures began to impact the spike barricades. The call to ignite all of the pitch barrels was given and an intense fire shot upwards all down the line. He sent an order down the line for his men to break into squads and cover the troops as they retreated to the high ground. And as Bjorn faced off with the Enchantress, the dragon suddenly blasted the mother of all fireballs towards his men. He flew in front covering his shield as it knocked him out of the sky. He impacted the river hard with the tips of his wings burning. Eric observed the troops retreating and saw this as his opportunity to slow the advance of the beasts. He shot down the battle line just over the water's edge, swinging his sword as fast as he could. He decapitated arms, legs and even heads from the reptiles, while severing a few tails from the scorpions. Then he heard a voice in his head saying, Eric, my love, come to me. The seductress was in his head again. He looked upwards to see her circling on the dragon's back. He could no longer resist and shot upwards. He had to meet her. And as he turned his back on the troops, many of the creatures breached the barricade and charged towards them. Bjorn was crawling out of the river onto the bank trying to recoup from the blast of fire when he heard the battle cries and screams of pain. He stumbled to his feet and shot towards the battle lines, needing a plan fast. Eric slowly drew closer to Serafina, a voice like a sweet siren call. She turned to pat the area behind her on the back of the dragon and said, Come, my love, sit and be close to me. Eric landed gently behind, and she turned, coming face to face, then leaned forward to kiss him. He was totally enamoured as he held her scaly hand in his. He was oblivious to the battle that raged underneath him. By the river, what was left of the 99 fought valiantly, but it was a losing battle, and they began to fall one by one. Men screamed as the scorpions impaled them, holding their bodies up in the air like a trophy. Some men made gurgling sounds as they tried to scream, but the reptiles had slashed or bitten deep into their throats. Bjorn began to use a spear to pick up some pitch kettles by handles and fling fireballs at the beasts. And one of the scorpions rushed him, and he dislodged a spike from the ground and skewered it, and then flew over the battle lines flinging it down at the other creatures. He flung several more pots of flaming pitch down upon the abominations, giving a guard time to retreat to the hilltop. He turned his attention upwards to the dragon and could not believe his eyes as Eric sat there upon the dragon's back with Serafina. He shot upwards at a high speed, calling out to Eric, Son, what are you doing? Eric smiled and replied, Father, I am with my true love, Serafina. My son, you must come to your senses right now. She will bring you only death and despair. And Eric's eyes were still fixed upon Serafina as she turned and said to Bjorn, Your son is now a man. He can make up his own mind, and he is mine now. Bjorn flew towards her in a rage, but just as he swung his sword, Eric dismounted and blocked the blow with his own sword. Father, I cannot allow you to harm her. I am in love with her. And as they stared each other down with swords crossed, Bjorn was feeling immense turmoil inside. Could he possibly harm his son in order to destroy this enchantress? Serafina suddenly tilted her head back with an ear-piercing screech and screamed out, Come forth, my servants! Come from your cracks, crevices, and dark places underground. And all around them, a high-pitched whine emanated upwards with an ever-increasing intensity. Suddenly, several dark clouds of varying sizes approached. Bjorn eyed them from a distance, and what he saw shocked him. Thousands of pre mantis like creatures with horns upon their heads swarmed over the land. They were about half the size of a man, and with sharp pincers having serrated teeth on the edges. They had large mandibles in their mouths for teeth, and they were descended upon the city. Bjorn lunged towards Eric, striking in the chest with the pummel of his sword. They rolled across the back of the dragon as they fell off. Bjorn clutched Eric by his chestplate and swung his sword down upon the beast, cutting the tip of its tail. The dragon roared and shot forward as Bjorn propelled he and Eric downwards for the cover of heavy trees.
Part 7. Divine Fire. Let's get straight into that. And as the remaining troops made it to the fortified area on top of the hill, they could see the swarms of praying mantis gushing out of the tunnels and sewer openings everywhere. And to make it worse, the remainder of the 99 now ran towards the hilltop, pursued by reptiles and scorpions, no more than a hundred yards behind them. Just as they dove through the barricades, General Tenorus gave the word to loose fiery arrows and flaming pitch. On a nearby forested hilltop, Bjorn shook Eric as he came to his senses. He said, Oh, father, what have I done? Bjorn responded, My son, what you did is not as important as what we must do now. And that is to slay that dragon. And just as they crouched to shoot skyward, the clouds filled with a familiar blue lightning, as ten shafts of brilliant blue light appeared on the south side of the river. Bjorn and Eric shot upwards to meet Adonio with nine more Grigori. And Adonio said, My brothers, there is no time to talk. We must pursue Seraphina and the dragon. She must not be allowed to wake Tiamat, the mother of the beast she rides. That serpent who cast a shadow of hellfire upon the land. You and young Eric will join me to pursue the dragon, while our brothers vanquish the rest of these abominations. And the reptiles and scorpions were beginning to breach the hilltop barricades, but the remaining men fought and prayed. Clouds of black smoke now covered them, as the mantis creatures began to pierce the smoke and attack indiscriminately. Daniel sped eastward with Bjorn and Eric behind. The nine Gregori shot downwards with six wading into the cloud of mantis and three descending upon the reptiles and scorpions. They began to dart about, hacking and slashing, as body parts from the beasts flew in all directions. Seraphina and the dragon were now in sight over the sea. Daniel shouted, Bjorn! Eric! Flank the beast while I cut it off. And with that, Adonio exploded forward in a blur and came to a stop several hundred yards in front of the beast. The dragon bore down on Adonio and blasted a huge fireball at him. He drew his sword and it illuminated with a brilliant shaft of blue flame that sliced the fireball in half as it went around him. And Seraphina brought the beast to a hover, confused about what to do as Bjorn bore down and cut off half of its tail. And as the great beast threw its head back with an epic roar, Eric flew underneath and disembowelled the beast. The great dragon's wings suddenly stopped moving, and it was in freefall towards the sea below. Adonio looked at Eric and said, My young brother, will you fetch her for us? Eric swooped down and pulled her from the dragon's back, only feet before it impacted the water. A quiet had fell over the hilltop, and the smoke began to clear as the surviving soldiers emerged. They witnessed a scene of carnage that none could explain, with decapitated carcasses lying everywhere. A few men reported seeing other winged beings among the mantis. Some said it was the Valkyrie, and others proclaimed it was angels. And Lars called out, Has anybody seen Arnie? He jumped onto the back of a scorpion beast. And the sad realization now became apparent that half of the guard and half of the troops were either dead or seriously injured. Then, through the smoke, emerged Arnie, limping towards them. He had ridden the scorpion beast's back under its tail, where it could not sting him and cause it to sting itself to death. The troops erupted with laughter at the story, and beyond, Eric and Adonio were now on a forested hilltop, a few miles away where they had brought down Serafina. The cadre of Gagore looked at Eric and smiled approvingly while he looked on in a state of wonder. It was time for Adonio to send them on their way, except for Samuel and Chemuel. They shot upwards in shafts of blue and were gone in an instant. Serafina sat quietly with her back against the tree. She had lost her serpent form and was now a beautiful young lady and with a kind demeanour but very sad eyes. And she began to cry and said, My father took the form of a young priest and seduced my mother. She named me Sarah. When I came of age, my father said my name would be Serafina. 
after the seraphim. He gave me sight to see the four corners of the earth. He said, I may have anything I desired. I chose Eric. And Antonio responded, But you carry the seed of the beast. You could never marry or have children, especially with the Grigori. That offspring will be far worse than a Nephilim. And she looked up at Eric and said, I'm sorry, I, I really, really like you. And Eric stood silent as Chimawell and Simawell wrapped chains around Serafina. And as she stared at Eric with tears rolling down her cheeks, a brilliant blue shaft of light engulfed them. And in a flash, they were gone. Daniel turned and put his hand on Eric's shoulder as he had once done to Beyond. My young brother, you overcame the unhealthy desires and passed your first test. There will be many more, both past and present. And he turned to Bjorn as they grasped each other by the forearms and said, Until that great day, brother. And then he smiled. He stepped back and disappeared up into a brilliant translucent blue light. Now Bjorn and Eric resumed their normal form and rejoined their comrades. We were worried that you had perished, said Commander Latrell. No, responded Bjorn. We uh, defended the church against attack from the beasts. It was a miracle, said Latrell. Many reported catching glimpses of angels, but all I saw the heavens open up with blue lightning. Yes, said Eric. We saw that lightning strike the dragon over the sea. As they rode back to board their ships, Eric hung his head and said, My father, I feel like I have failed you. How could I raise a hand to you? My son, I could see the conflict in your eyes and feel the turmoil in your soul. But you came to your senses, and together we slew the dragon. Soon now that you have passed your first test with a seductress, let's see how you do with a Viking woman when we return. And Eric laughed as his father put his arm around his neck and they boarded the ship. Epilogue In that great day, few will receive pardon. Many will suffer perdition. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Chest pounding, absolutely riveting story there. Once again, from our incredible brother, from another mother, Rico Stories. Big thank you once again, Rico, for penning these incredible adventures. Each and every one is a masterpiece in its own way. And I really do hope that you enjoy my rendition once again. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, of course, if you can pen a story packing that much punch, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you're all well and happy. Had a fantastic start to the week. And you're trying to stay fit and focused. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.